actually it's on the way, but then the process has already started with the distribution of the PPE. And then sec our second speaker is going to be Dr. Marie, who's going to speak about donning and doffing of our PPE, the PPE that we constantly speak about. It's important to put it on properly so that you protect yourself while you're working on the patient and to also take it off correctly so that you still protect yourself against the virus that might be sitting on the PPE. So I do not want to waste any time. We've got Dr. Blackie Swart as well to anchor the speakers as we will be taking questions at the end. Dr. Smith is going to be uh, uh, speaking and then immediately after that, Dr. Marie will do her talk and then we will take the questions. So please just pop your questions in and then we will address them at the end of the session. So over to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, um, it's really a pleasure to, to be with everyone tonight. I can see the participants are, are really getting a lot. It's, it's already on 348. It's really nice to, to be able to share virtually and also to have contact with everyone. So welcome everyone. Uh, and I'm just going to start by sharing my screen now. So we've had a little bit of a technical glitch with, with Mac. Um, and it seems like the Zoom update has, has made something uh, a little bit more difficult for us now. Uh, so when I share my screen, apparently the resolution doesn't come out correctly. Um, Tabasin, can you just let me know if what this looks like and if this is a, um, okay to go on like this? Uh, Dr. Smith, it is fine to go on like this. It's still the same, but it's okay. just a little bit. You can still continue. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to continue like this. And then if you need to change anything, you can just let me know. Okay. Uh, so guys, we are talking about front office management tonight, which is not a clinical topic, but I really believe that this is one of the most important things to chat about, especially during the COVID time. Um, communication with our staff and communication with our patients happens through our receptionists and through the rest of the team. So it's very important to know what to say and how to effectively communicate. So if we look at what we're going to do tonight, so we start with the role of the receptionist, um, patient communication, screening, triage, the facility setup, and then the arrival of the patient. So we'll focus on office management, the patient screening and communication. So it's very, very much a, a practice management driven topic tonight. So the role of the receptionist. I believe that this is one of the positions in a practice that is often neglected. And if we think of how important this position is, now, we should ask ourselves the question, do, do we really have, firstly, do we have people that are trained properly? Uh, do we have a, a receptionist that, that uh, is a representation of your practice, of the dentistry that you do? And um, those are the things that you need to, 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 to ask yourself when you employ a receptionist. Um, a receptionist is the first impression a patient has of who you are and, and they don't always make that decision the moment they have a filling, they make the decision when they speak to the receptionist on the phone that that first contact is extremely important. So this is a quote that, that I read quite a while ago. The first contact with our, we have with our patients is vital to the success of their overall dental experience. It starts with the first phone call and often ends there. So just, just think about that. Just let that sink in as well. If you can just imagine your patient flow. So how do people actually get to your practice? So they get to your practice by phoning or emailing uh, the, the practice. And then there's a, there's a protocol, there's a system that you have in place of getting those patients booked in. Now, at the moment, that process has changed. And we need to be able to communicate effectively with our receptionist. And we all listening to these webinars, we are attending a million webinars and we educating ourselves as practitioners. But are you rely, relaying that information to your receptionist? Are you making sure that all of this information actually gets across to them as well? 
And that is our duty. Implementing this is extremely important. So if we think of the general role of a receptionist, we want them to be caring. We want them to be effective communicators. And how do we do this now in the time of COVID? So you already have a scared patient. People are scared to come to the dentist. People don't want to come to the dentist. And now people are even more afraid. How do we manage that? How do we confidently communicate with our patients? What are the things that we need to say to make them feel assured and to make them feel like they will be safe at our practices? So the first thing is, remember, this is your doorkeeper. Your receptionist is your first line of defense. I think we all fall in the trap of spending a lot of time on PPE, spending a lot of time on air purification systems and this science and that science because we are scientists and we're clinicians. But remember that the best way to screen and to prevent this virus to come into your practice is to prevent it from coming into your practice by screening patients. And, and that's such a simple thing but it's actually the most effective way to do that. So equip your receptionist with the correct training. Like I said earlier, make sure all of this information that we are constantly getting and things are changing. So when we in level five, we say things differently to when we are in level four and level three. And we constantly need to make sure that the receptionists also are aware of those changes. And when we communicate with our patients, make sure that this is confident communication, reassuring communication. One way that's very practical that we can make sure that the receptionist knows exactly what to say is to use templates and scripts. Now templates is something that you can set up by email or you can actually have, um, Shanae also told me that they in, your, in their practice, they've got little cue cards. So you can have a flow chart, you can have templates, and this is not to be robotic. It's to make sure that the message comes across correctly. Um, in my practice, we've had several instances where people are either misunderstanding things um, or that because of the uncertainty of the situation, they, they just really don't know what it, what it all means. So there's a constant communication and it's ex actually quite exhausting. So the receptionist needs to be very, very well trained in how to manage this. Another role of the receptionist during this period is to register patients during check-in. You want to make sure you have a, um, a register of everyone, but I think that it's quite obvious that we have that in our practice management. In any case, you will take um, a, the, uh, 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 the temperature of a patient like we normally do. And then we obviously have a screening document and a consent form. Now in level five, this consent form that was published by SADA um, was very much applicable to level five. Um, I don't think that the same consent form is applicable to level four and to level three. Um, and I mean, I'm happy to be corrected here, but I, in our practice, we actually changed it slightly to make it more applicable to the levels that we are in. Um, because in level five, it clearly states that it's only emergency treatment. Um, so, but those things need to be done and that needs to be communicated to the, the patient. And then this is the age of technology. I mean, we're sitting here with a, a, in a virtual meeting. There are so many resources that are available to us to actually use at the moment where we can communicate with our patients. And some of these resources are free or very cheap. So think of WhatsApp for business. I can highly recommend this as a tool for your practice. Uh, it's something that you can use to communicate with your patients almost instantly. Very few people read SMSs these days. So that's becoming a less effective communication tool. And emails will always be a more professional and a more formal way of communicating. So use those tools that we have. This is a video that I want to quickly share with you guys, it's really just the way that we set up our communication with our patients to explain to them the way that we will manage the appointment, the safety precautions that we're taking, and also to put their mind at ease. 
I hope the video works. Okay, so the video just, just stopped there. Um, sorry, can you still hear me? Um, I don't know. The video just stopped there in the middle. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. We the, can still we can still hear okay. you. Yeah. Okay, so the video actually stopped playing in the middle. I'm not going to try and play it again. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make with the video, sorry for the technical glitches, guys, is we have technology at our disposal to communicate with our patients. And this is a video that Jean made for us. So Jean is my, is my partner in the practice. So we didn't pay someone extra to make this video for us. I'm very fortunate to have Jean in the practice because he's really good with the graphic design stuff. So it's not something that I would necessarily be able to do, but try and use extra tools, tools out of the box to communicate with your patients. So when we think of scheduling appointments, the way that we want to schedule appointments is with large gaps in between. So we want to have 15 minute gaps in between our patients. Um, all the information that I'm sharing with you guys today is available on the SADA webs uh, on the document that was published by Black and his team. Um, and there are cited research there as well for why we are doing this and why we have these 15 minute gaps in between. So, 15 minutes to clean the area, and that needs to be communicated with your patient as well. So managing the expectations and the way that they see our time is really important. If you have a patient that comes to the practice without the mask, without the correct gear, and someone that doesn't believe that this thing exists, you have to provide them with the protective gear as well. And then managing this whole setup, and you are actually allowed to refuse someone entrance into your practice at this stage. So before the appointment, what happens? There's a phone screening, there's a screening form that's filled in, a consent form, and a normal medical history. Now people can get very exhausted when they see all of this admin and all of this forms and stuff. So try and make it easier for them. One way of doing it is to have online fillable PDF forms that people can fill in at home, that they don't have to fill in anything on paper. And that's a very easy way of doing it so that they don't have to print stuff at home and then sign. And it is legal consent if you sign a form online. So don't worry that it is not legal if they don't print out the forms. So, the way that we've set up our screening form, I'm very happy to make this available to anyone. Um, I've just used the, the, uh, the screening questions that we received as guidelines and we put it in a, in a PDF format. And now the patient can just tick yes or no. So the questions are very obvious. And if you guys follow SADA on Facebook, you would have seen that on, on the Facebook page, they actually gave those questions as well. So just follow the, the regular questions. Do, are you coughing? Do you have shortness of breath? Do you have a fever? Loss of taste or smell? Have you been in contact with any COVID positive patients? And then we also ask patients if they um, fall into a higher risk category. So are you over 60? Do you have any comorbidities? And have you traveled? And then if they answer yes or no, um, it's, if they answer yes, it doesn't mean that they can't have an appointment. Um, you'll see at the end there, we say positive responses to any of these would likely indicate a deeper discussion with the dentist before proceeding with elective dental work. Now that just means if a patient has had contact with someone, I need to know about that. If a patient has a lot of comorbidities and it's an older patient, I need to know about that. So we use scheduling protocols. 
the beginning of the day, we see our patients that have comorbidities and are, that are, are more at risk. So we see our elderly patients and patients with underlying conditions in the beginning of the day, early morning. Then we see at the end of the day, patients that we feel are more at risk of infecting people. So if you think of a medical doctor that works at Tigerberg, for instance, that is a patient that is more at risk of infecting people potentially. So I'm going to see that patient right at the end of the day so that my room can be fumigated and cleaned and ready for the next morning. You'll also see then that the screening questionnaire has two columns. The one is before the appointment and then the one is in office. I feel it's really important to have a, an in office screening time as well because things change. Someone might be filling in this questionnaire two weeks or a week or three days before they come for the appointment and then things might have changed. Something else that um, we've come across, just troubleshooting this process, what do you do when a patient has already filled in a screening form and they come for a second appointment, maybe in a week's time? You don't have to send them the questionnaire again, but we do a second questionnaire in office and we then document that um, on our clinical notes. So it is important every time you have contact with a patient to do this screening for your sake and for theirs. Then the consent form, like I said, we've used the modified version of the level five consent form. Um, and basically it just tells patients that there are risks associated with dental treatment in this time. And also that aerosol producing agents we are trying to avoid that, but if there's anything that we have to, to do aerosol producing procedures, then there's even more risk. So we communicate that with patients and they have to sign the consent form before they come to, to the practice. Um, this is not a regulation that, that has to be adhered. That is not a protocol that sort of put out that everyone has to do. Um, this is something that we do personally. Um, uh, the only, a document that we have as a guideline, there's the level five consent form. So let's just summarize, what are we, the what are, are we gonna tell our patients before the, the appointment? The first thing we tell them is, we need them to wear a clean mask. So either a new mask or freshly washed mask. We don't want them to have any accessories. So no earrings, no, um, watches, if it's possible, no jackets, um, umbrellas, it's winter time, so people have scarves and all kinds of stuff. What we also found is that even though you ask people to not bring stuff, they still bring stuff. So we um, have a process that we put all of the accessories in a storage container as they enter the practice. So those black storage boxes that you use for moving purposes, it's not a very big box, but we have one for every room. Um, and we put the patient's accessories and scarves and jackets and cell phones and everything in that container. And we place it in front of the room that they're being treated in because we don't want that in the clinical room. Um, it, it has been very well accepted by our, by our patients. And I think it's maybe a good, a good way to to just try and minimize the, the stuff in the, in the clinical area. We then clean these storage containers every time and they can be reused. We want people to also be on time. So we communicate with our patients by telling them that they can't come early. And if they come early, they have to wait outside because we want a minimum amount of people in the reception area. So the reception area is not a place for relaxing and cozying up and having comfort anymore. Unfortunately, that's all changed. Our reception area hardly has more than one patient in at a time at the moment. And so we ask our patients to wait in their car and the moment they are, uh, we are ready for them, we send them a WhatsApp and they come in and they're going directly to the room. So there's no waiting. And if they do have to wait for some reason afterwards, then we have chairs set up uh, with social distancing principles in mind. And then um, if you're in a clinic situation that people can't wait in the car, you might want people to wait outside. 
if people can't wait outside, you might want to just at least limit the spacing of the, the amount of people in your practice in the reception area and make sure that the spacing um, is adequate. We are able to see walk-in patients, but also they might have to wait outside. If you have a situation where there's a queue forming outside, you have to also then adhere to social distancing principles and have a lot, um, allocated space for people so that they're not too close to each other if they're queuing up outside your practice. Online forms um, would be easier to use, like we said, try and use technology to make it easier for, for patients to fill it in and also to minimize the amount of contact with paper and pens. Then when we, when we take the payments, we prefer using something like SnapScan or Zapper. Um, also the tapping of a credit card. Um, you can also use a credit card machine that's wrapped in a, a wrapping pl um, plastic and then you change that every time. Um, but we prefer not to take cash. And then on the SADA document, they also communicate to patients that patient that their staff that your staff might have had the flu injection. Um, so this is something that we also did in, in our practice right before level five. I'm not sure how practical it is for everyone to get flu injections for their staff, but that would be amazing if you can communicate that to your patients to show them how much you are doing for them. If you have a suspected positive patient, um, you are able to refuse treatment. You are also then suggest that you rather use pharma pharmacological treatment, which means antibiotics. And if someone, if you feel that there's a clinic that's more um, ready for this patient or that's more equipped to see this patient, you can refer a patient to that clinic or to one of the centers that's allocated to see patients that are positive. Um, and then also treat these patients at the end of the day um, and isolate, refer to testing centers if you think that it is necessary. Now, when it comes to the facility and the team setup, if you think of your reception area, if you can't have any of the um, accessories available um, in your reception area anymore. You can't have magazines lying around. That's a, that's a risk because if people touch that, um, they could infect each other. You can't have children's toys. Um, think of your coffee station potentially, um, or even just stuff lying around. You can't have anything really in the reception area except for seating for patients. So try and limit what you have there. And then the essential stuff that you need to work, so computers and, and keyboards and things you can cover with cling wrap and replace after, after you've used it. Seating separation is, is really ideal. Now, practically, this is not always possible, but try and do this as much as you can. Um, if you can, don't have large couches where people are potentially gonna sit close to each other, rather have chairs that are separate. And think of the surfaces that you have in your reception area. So you want clean, flat, hard surfaces that's easy to clean. Also consider the fact that the viruses live longer on certain surfaces than others. Oh, I just wanted to quickly show you this video. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, this is just to show you how we've set up the reception area. So that couch is not being used at the moment and those chairs are rather used if we have more than one patient um, in, the, in the practice. The facility and team setup continued. We look at the storage container that, we, that I spoke about to, to provide something that patients can put their valuables in and to make them feel safe. Um, seating in the practice one patient at a time and obviously we want them to sterilize and to clean their hands as they enter into the practice. So have available a, a, um, an area where there's hand sanitizer for your patients as they enter the practice. It's also a good idea for someone to receive the patients as they enter the practice. Uh, this is also a video that we did for, for, for the, the SADA protocol document um, just to show how we communicate with patients in regards to expectations when they arrive at the practice.
So the next um, facility and team set up, if we continue here, SODA is advising us to, to have a triage and waiting area. So if you think of the reception area as a triage and waiting area, that's a lowish risk area that you want to separate from your clinical area. So think of you know, the, the way that we would approach things when we went to theater, have, you have an, a clinical and a non-clinical area. So have demarcated areas in your practice. It's maybe sometimes it's easier to actually have type, to put type in where you feel this is a, a clinical area and to, to then separate it visually. Um, it's also really helpful if you put posters up for patients to see where a clinical area and a non-clinical area is separated. Um, remember a lot of the stuff that we're doing, we are also doing very visually so that people can see that we're doing it. So when, when we want people to feel safe, um, it, it doesn't help if we're doing this stuff and we're sort of hiding away doing it. We want to do it in a way that they can see that we are really going um, the extra mile to make it safe for them. Um, so in the facility, the orange area on the screen there, that's where you would do normal dentistry. So that's a, a more medium risk type of area. Um, where you're trying to limit aerosols. A staff area would be great to have if you're fortunate to enough to have a separate staff area where people can remove their full PPE and mm. to actually relax. Um, and then um, it's important to have an, an isolation clinic. So that's a, an area that's set up specifically when there's high risk patients or when you have patients or high um, aerosol producing um, procedures. When, when we communicate to our staff, um, I mean, it really ties into what we said earlier about reception. Um, we want to make sure that our staff also feel safe. And it's so important to keep the communication channels open when we speak to them. Um, the staff should be screened when they come to work and the registers should be kept for, for the screening purposes. Temperature should be checked as they enter. And then make sure that people don't feel bad or awkward if they might have been in contact with someone that's positive or if they are sick. Um, I think there's so many people that are so concerned about losing a job that they might actually come to work even though they, they might feel sick. So just make sure that your staff really understand that they have to communicate these things with you. Um, so just make sure that those channels are open. Make sure you, you provide cleaning stations um, wherever you have these demarcated areas set up. So if you're moving from a clinical to a non-clinical area, um, make sure that there's a, a changing station, a cleaning station for, with hand sanitizer for your staff as well. Um, as many as you can. So however many areas you have hand sanitizer and, and hand washing stations, it, it will really just help. Um, and then the way that we are approaching um, staff coming to the practice. So if you, if you can imagine that they arrive at the practice in their street clothes, then take on, taking off shoes um, and then getting dressed in the practice into clean uniforms. They wear these uniforms and then with obviously with PPE um, for the day. And then that, that uniform is not clean anymore. After um, the day is over, they change back into their street clothes. And this is all done in a non-clinical area. Um, and the dirty uniform is put in a bag and we instruct our, our, our staff to go home, to put these clothes in the washing machine immediately and then to immediately take a shower. So you want to make sure that people are aware of the protocols that they can follow to make sure that it is safe for them. Um, I also think that if you're fortunate enough to be able to clean the uniforms of your staff, that's even better. But as we see with this whole process, not everything is practical for everyone. You also wanna provide hair protection, whether that's a disposable cap or washable scrub caps. Um, you want to provide that also for, for the staff. Facility and team setup continued. We look at the delivery of packages. Um, we want 
people to not come into the practice that shouldn't be there. So receive these packages outside. It's a good idea to have a signed note that you can just give to them so that you don't have to touch anything. And then minimize patient staff contact. Don't have situations where people are chatting and, and also staff to staff contact where it's where there's a clinical situation where people are, are, are just unnecessarily chatting. And I mean, this is, this is not nice because we actually want to form relationships with our patients, but we want to minimize the patient contact. Um, another nice idea is to have a perspect sheet in front of the reception and desk. These are also available everywhere at the moment. And then just as a, as a note to, to emphasize when the patient arrives, it is really nice if you can receive a patient at the door and then go through the whole process of what they can expect again. And this is time consuming and labor intensive and extremely exhausting, but it really helps. So when people come into the practice, they often don't know what to expect. They don't know where to go, what to do or where to sit. Even though you've sent all this information to them, they still don't always read it. So receiving someone, putting their, their accessories in the storage box and then guiding them to the room um, is really helpful. Being welcoming, making sure that they feel safe. And the, the person that receives the patient is someone that needs to be friendly um, and comforting. Because we have masks on, no one sees anyone's faces anymore. So have someone that has at least a friendly voice and friendly eyes. Um, and then manage the amount. This is someone that has to manage people from outside. Um, and this is really a, a, a key role that the receptionist or someone else can play. And then just in closing, um, I want to emphasize again that this is all about communication. All of the information that you have in your mind at the moment, all the millions of webinars that you've done, it means nothing if we don't implement this. And the way to implement this is to communicate with our staff and to communicate with our patients. So let's work on that rather than just absorbing information. Let's start giving it out and let's start communicating and making sure that our patients feel safe again to come back to the dentist. Thank you very much. Um, you are very welcome to contact me if you need any advice or any guidance. I'm really happy to, to help out. Um, my email address is available. Um, I think this is a time where we're all struggling through this. So I'm very happy to help out if I can help someone set up their reception area. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Um, colleagues, let me indicate that we are seeing your questions and they will be responded uh, to by the panelists as soon as uh, Dr. Marie is done with her presentation without wasting any time. Dr. Marie, I'm gonna hand over to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining everyone on Facebook and on Zoom. So tonight, my topic is donning and doffing for dental professionals in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The best designed and engineered items of PPE will fail healthcare workers and their patients if they are not donned and doffed correctly. When preparing to care for a patient during this pandemic, it is important to understand the series of events that takes place to cause this disease or infection. The series of events is known, the series of events is known as the chain of infection, and there are multiple links where we can intercept this chain to break the spread of in infection. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Oh, sorry. Uh, hi there. Siri is interfering with my webinar over here. <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> Let me just um, <laughs> deactivate her over here. <laughs> All right, so, so let's cut it. Sorry, guys. Um, hopefully, she won't interfere again. Nothing of the technical side is working besides Siri. So, um, one of these links in the chain of infection is the mode of transmission. 
So the mode of transmission um, is the means in which the path pathogen travels to a new host. In the case of COVID-19, it spreads via contact, droplet, droplets, and airborne. This is where dental professionals should act to intercept the chain of infection in their workplace by using PPE in the correct way. To break the chain of infection, SADA recommends protective equipment in the following categories. The skull to protect the parts of the head normally covered by air. Then there's the face, um, the, the skin normally visible. Your eyes, that also includes the age you use um, to improve your vision. And then the nose and the mouth is to protect your airway and also the mucous membranes inside the nose and the mouth. Then the next category is the body. So you want to protect your garments, your undergarments, and then also your limbs, and then obviously the hands and the feet. SADA released a protocol in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which included four diagrams. So the first two diagrams, diagram one and two, shows the recommended essential minimum standards of PPE that you have to use during non-aerosol and aerosol generating procedures. So I'm not gonna go into the details of, this, um, of these two diagrams because they will be discussed on Thursday, I think, um, in a separate webinar. The one thing I do want to highlight is this. During aer aerosol generating procedures, goggles should be used. If you prefer to use normal clinical eyewear, then you have to use a, a visor, a rigid visor in con conjunction with that. Normal protective eyewear is not enough um, or is not a substitute for goggles. Then diagrams three and four shows you the ideal standards of PPE during non-aerosol and aerosol generating procedures. For the purpose of this webinar tonight, I will be focusing on the ideal standards of PPE for aerosol generating procedures. I will discuss the donning and doffing of the following. So the disposable surgical cap, sterilized goggles, um, your respirator mask, a disposable surgical gown or a suit like this, surgical gloves and disposable shoe covers. So although the best possible options regarding PPE will be provided, they will have, they will have absolutely no impact if they are not used correctly. So um, the donning of PPE should be done in a separate room than the one you are going to see the patient in. Um, so it should be a safe zone and all your donning equipment should be in there already. Check the donning in that room before you start putting everything on um, to see if there's any defects. Then if you have long hair, tie your hair up. If, you're, if you have a beard, that should be shaven um, for the fit of the respirator mask. And if you have jewelry on, that should be removed. Correct donning and doffing should become part of your everyday routine. So let's just have a look at the sequence of donning. So the first step is hand hygiene. This poster by the WHO illustrates the correct hand hygiene procedure. I have a poster such as the one provided in the slide somewhere in the donning area. Hand hygiene seems very simple, simple enough, um, but this step is often rushed and not performed adequately. Um, it is the simplest yet most effective step in combating the virus. So here's just the video. Um, hopefully it works of how to wash your hands. Wet hands with water and apply enough soap to cover all surfaces of the hands. Let the water run smoothly to avoid touching the tap later on. Rub hands palm to palm to obtain a good quantity of foam. Then rub right palm over the back of left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub again palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked, repeating this action for each hand. 
rub rotationally left thumb clasped in right palm and vice versa. To clean the tips of the fingers, rub rotationally backwards and forwards with clasped fingers of right hand in left palm and vice versa. Rinse hands thoroughly with running water. Dry hands thoroughly with a single use towel. If the tap is not elbow operated, use this towel to turn off the tap without touching it directly. Your hands are now clean and safe. All right, so the hand hygiene should be no less than 20 seconds. I'm sure you know that by now, but if you see the video, you can understand that there's a few steps that you have to follow. It's not just, yeah, not just a rush, rush procedure. So the next step is to put on your gown. Um, the gown should be secured behind your neck and behind your, your waist. And there should be no undergarments showing anywhere when your gown is on. The third step is to place your mask. So you put the mask over your nose and your mouth. Then it has two elastics. The one elastic goes above the ear and the other one goes below the ear. So the top elastic is round about in, on the crown of the head and the other one, the lower one is on the neck. Um, once the mask is in place, use, use both your hands to mold that metal bar over the bridge of your nose. So don't pinch it because it's not going to actually seal around the bridge of your nose. You should mold it with both hands. And then once the mask is in place, you should do a fit test. So um, this is very important. It's probably the most important step of this, of putting on the mask. Um, so during this fit check, fit check or fit test, um, you breathe out against the resistance of the respirator mask and you check for air leakage. So you can check for the air leakage with the tips of your fingers or even with your eyelashes. Um, and then again, you breathe inwards and check if there's any air coming in from the sides of the mask. If that happens, you have to readjust it um, because then it's not sealing properly. Now you put on your goggles. Uh, make sure it is comfortable and that it's secure. Um, it should fit to form a tight seal. You don't want to fiddle with your mask once you're in the patient room. So make sure that it's fine. Everything is sealed. It's not fogging up. Um, check that while you are in the safe donning zone. Then lastly, you perform hand hygiene and you put on your gloves. I'm going to show you a video now of the donning procedure. Um, in this donning procedure, you're going to see that they double glove um, during the procedure. So in dentistry, it's a bit impractical to double glove because you lose dexterity. Um, but I'll, later on in the webinar, I'll, I'll discuss an alternative um, for double gloving during doffing because you're going to need two pairs of gloves when you remove your PPE. The last step um, before I show the video of donning is you need a second person to check whether everything is fine um, or maybe a mirror if you have one. So, so you should do a 360 and they should check if all your undergarments are covered, if everything is fine, if there's no air showing. Um, so yeah, so let's have a look at the video. Okay, Ross, can you open up the PPE bag? Put it out on the table and don your PPE. Right, Ross, can you start with some hand hygiene? Then you can put your disposable apron on. Open your repellent gown. And before you put your gown on, put your first set of gloves on. Put your uh, N95 or equivalent mask on. You may need to remove your glasses. One strap goes below the ear. One strap goes above the ear. It's then critical that you ensure it's fitting well. So mold the malleable 
metal strip around your nose and cheeks rather than pinching it. And once you place it on, check for leaks. Forceful breathing in and out should make the mask move and you can use your hands, your eyelashes to feel if you're moving any air out through the mask. It should be just about perfect seal. Next is eye protection. Your disposable cap has moved backwards. Please cover your hair again. Next is outer gloves. So pull the sleeves of your gowns down over your knuckles so that when you put your gloves on, they cover the cuff. We tape the gloves to the sleeves of the gown to make sure they come off when you remove the gown in one piece. Don't put the tape circumferentially, otherwise you might block blood supply to the hands. Lauren, please write Ross's name and his role on the front of his chest. Lauren, will you please uh, check Ross as he rotates through 360 to make sure that he's properly donned. There should be no undergarments visible. The gown should be completely closed at the back. Um, no gaps. All right, so now we get to doffing. Um, all movements during the doffing procedure should be slow and intentional. You don't want to spread any contaminated or you don't want to aerosolize any of the contaminants that's on the used PPE. You'll need a second pair of gloves for the doffing pr procedure. Um, as I've mentioned, the double gloving in, in dentistry is a bit impractical. Um, you need dexterity, it's crucial in our profession. So what you can do is you can, after the procedure, you perform hand hygiene and then you don a second pair of clean gloves before you start the doffing procedure. Okay, so you remove your shoe covers and then you get to your gown and, and your outer gloves. Um, you remove your disposable gown by untying the, uh, untying the straps at the waist and the neck. Then you pull the gown away from your body. Um, so make sure that the gloves come off while you pull it away and you only ever touch the contaminated surface of the gown with contaminated gloves or the outer gloves. Um, roll it up carefully and then place it into a medical waste bin or into, into the bin um, and make sure that there's nothing hanging out of the bin. Um, gowns left hanging outside of the bin are a risk for contamination. Now you perform hand hygiene again, and then you get to your eyewear. So to remove your eyewear, you take it at the straps on the back of the head. You never touch the front of the eyewear. Take it at the straps and pull it away and away from the face. Um, and then you use, put it on a trolley and you use surface disinfectant to disinfect the eyewear and you use paper towel to dry it. Your respirator masks, you, always, you also take, you, you use the straps. So you remove the respirator by grabbing the straps at the back and pulling it forward and away from the face. Do not touch the front of the mask at any time. Remove your head cover by pinching the top and pulling it away from, from your head, up and away. And then you perform hand hygiene again. So since the, the virus is airborne, um, it is recommended not to remove the PPE prior to leaving the contaminated room. Um, here's a video just to recap everything again. Um, I think uh, a graphic way of seeing it is, is always better. And Ross, I'm gonna coach you through doffing of your PPE. Please move to the red bin and get rid of all the disposables that we've used or have not used. You can now start by taking off your boots and then your repellent gown and outer gloves. Untie the tie, put it away from your chest, 
only ever touching the contaminated surface with contaminated gloves. And make sure your outer gloves come off with the sleeves. Please proceed to the not hot area. Please clean your hands. Please remove your goggles and place it on the trolley. You may now use surface disinfectant to disinfect the trolley and the goggles. Everything that's been in the theater is contaminated, and so the whole trolley must be disinfected. When that's complete, you're going to remove your gloves and apron. Putting away from yourself so it doesn't touch your body. Carefully scrumple it up so that it doesn't hang over the sides of the dustbin. Into the red bin and your gloves. Pinch. Cover. Pull. Pull. Disinfect your hands. Now that your hands are clean, please remove your mask, grab the straps at the back, pull them forward, do not touch the front of your mask at any time, and discard, and then your hat. Pulling it forward, away from your face and head. Perform a final hand hygiene. Your doffing procedure is now complete. Please assist your team members to doff their PPE. All right, so um, complacency should be guarded against. Uh, we are on level three now, the cases are rising, so there's no reason for us to become complacent. Um, correct donning and doffing of PPE is essential to secure your safety and the safety of your patients. Let's break the chain of infection. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marie. Um, I think at this time, we're going to address all the questions. Dr. Smith, you can unmute yourself there. I'm going to read out the questions. I've already okay. uh, started to skim through the questions, so I'm going to read out the questions. And then if it's relevant to you, then you will give uh, the answer. The first question, do dental assistants have to change all their PPE after every treatment? If not, what has to be changed all the time? I think that's, um, is that a PPE question more? Yes, yes, Dr. Smith. Okay. Yeah, so, so I will answer that. Um, yeah. I, th I think we cannot be too careful. So, so the protocol that they've released, um, Blackie can also help here, um, is for all healthcare or, or dental professionals, the assistant including, if they worked on the patient in the same proximity as you, um, there's no reason why they shouldn't change their PPE after a, yeah, after the procedure. Okay. And then um, the next question, what about during oxygen saturation as temperature reading is unreliable? Importance of that is that patients report to the hospital with very low SATs readings. I don't know which one it belongs to, Doc. So I will, I will answer that. Um, I saw okay. the question earlier um, and I actually just, okay. I, I, I was trying to find any any sort of research or documentation or science for either way to you know to to try and and look at what the science says. But I think this is one of those cases where we will only see the evidence and we'll only find the science to back our findings after a while. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything that really um, can tell us that taking temperatures is is effective, but it is a guideline that we're using. So it, that, that's, that, that's the only, the simplest way to answer the question, I'm afraid. 
Okay. All right, Dr. Smith. And the next question, I think, is more relevant to head office staff members. Uh, Dr. Omar, please be on the lookout. As soon as the, the, the questionnaires are available, they will be published on the SADA website. So just be on the lookout. Uh, head office will publish them as soon as they're available. And then we've got Dr. Clement. Dr. Clement is quite a regular with our, our webinars. So I'm going to link this question with the next question that he asks. So what and why is dentistry sitting on the sideline? Then he asks, uh, why are we not doing testing? Sure, I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that. Blackie, I, that's yours. I think maybe we can give it to Dr. Swar. Uh, could you just repeat the question again? Dr. Swart, Dr. Clement wants to know why dentists are sitting on the sideline and why they're not doing testing. Um, they are uh, very uh, welcome to do the testing as long as they go for training. Um, it is in our field and the uh, pharynx is part of our uh, daily normal work area. So doing testing ourselves, if you have done the necessary qualification course, is obviously the good choice to do and the good thing for the dentist to do. Yes. And actually, Dr. Swalsada did offer one, one webinar. I think it was one of the first educational webinars that we offered. We did offer the training for screening and testing. So I think most of our practitioners that attended that webinar will be comfortable to do the test. So... I agree with you on that one. Um, so yeah, Dr. They, Smith, yes, Dr. Swart? People doing uh, pathology uh, specimens, how to uh, do uh, the sealing of it, how to handle that, and how to correctly identify that, because that all becomes very important to the chain and also to the epidemiologists to follow up these cases. Certainly, Dr. Swart. Um, Dr. Smith, I think this next question is for you. All well and good if you have a practice serving patients with, the, with electronic communication means, but what if you are in a small town practice in the poorest part of the country where your patient uh, base is more than 50% made up of poor rural population and most not on medical aid, and you have been helping them at below medical aid rates for years. How do we keep doing, how do we keep going or should we leave the community without dental treatment? So that's a, that's a very tough question. Um, and I, I completely understand why it would be difficult to almost impossible to use technology in, a circum, in circumstances like that. Um, I would still uh, challenge the, the, the person asking the question um, that um, I think the stats are in the excess of 90% of, of South Africans that use smartphones. Um, so even though people are poor, they still have access to smartphones. And a lot of poor people are still on Facebook. And a lot of mm. poor people use social media. So even though we are poor, we still have these communication tools, which sometimes are even free. To, to communicate with our patients. But I agree that it is challenging if you're sitting in a very, very rural setup. No, I agree with you there. Um, and WhatsApp is also a very popular uh, uh, communication channel. Um, and it's found on many phones, even, even phones that are not even smartphones. They do exactly. support WhatsApp. I agree yeah. with you there. And then- um, Dr. Metzing, may I come yes, in here please? What? Yes, Dr. Swart, certainly. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've actually addressed that in the protocol document. Uh, because in this rural areas, as long as the patients are lined up outside of the surgery, um, a correctly PPE addressed person from the practice can do that questionnaire outside of the practice in a social distancing way. So they go from one patient to the other to the next and do that questionnaire as long as they've got a three-ply mask and a face shield on. It is the recommended way to treat the patients in the rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Swart. 
uh, that does provide a lot of uh, clarity. Please advise how long it takes for the virus to settle onto surfaces once AGPs are done. Um, that's one of the things that is quite contentious still um, in the science. Um, the only thing that is evident is that the virus lived the longest on metal surfaces um, and that plastic and hard surfaces are the easiest to clean. So there's no real answer yet. I think that that will still become available to us. Um, but I think material um, would not be advised. So if you think of couches and, and large chairs in, in reception areas that's often used, that's not advised, but rather a plastic chair that can be sterilized much easier. Okay, thank you, Doc. Um, for the female professionals wearing a headscarf or a duk for religious or cultural reasons, are we safe with our hair covered? Uh, Dr. Marie, I think you spoke about uh, uh, yes, the hair. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so um, the, the scarf or the duke is, is fine, but you need a disposable thing over that because you need to change it for every patient. Um, you don't want to carry something from one patient to the other. So the idea is a disposable surgical head cover over your duke or your scarf. Um, that would be appropriate. I think Blackie can advise us, but I think that's the way to go. I think that's, I think that's sufficient, uh, Dr. Mary. And then here's another question for you, Dr. Marie. How do you doff reusable gowns? Sorry, how do you doff reusable gowns? Yes. So reusable gowns, I don't think that's, that's advised um, if it's not autoclaved or, or completely sterile. So if it is sterile, then you would doff it exactly the same as a disposable gown. You just would put it in a basket afterwards and yeah wash it and then autoclave it and then you can reuse it yeah okay here's another one for you as well uh dr marie um can one use hand sanitizers on latex gloves before doffing in between procedures in the pa on the patient yes um so 70 percent alcohol based i think is the recommended the recommendations. So you can either use soap and water or you can use the hand sanitizer, 70% alcohol based. Okay. Um, and then here's another one. Is, is doffing not done in the clinical area? So, so the idea of doffing is you want to do it where you are safe if you take it off. So the first thing in the morning, obviously everything is still safe. But after the first patient, there's aerosols, or there can be aerosols if you did an aerosol generating procedure. So then you cannot doff in a clinical area because the, the area is not safe anymore. Um, so you don't want to ideally be without a mask or, a, or goggles in the area if there are aerosols. Um, so that's, that's why you need a separate room where you doff the PPE, um, where it's safe to be without PPE. Okay. And then um, dentistry needs to be carried out with magnification. How do you incorporate loops? That's the first part of the question. What of the usually increased plastic or rubber waste, foot, waste footprint created by thousands of dentists around the world? Okay, so, so the first question is the magnification. Um, I actually saw Blackie use these magnification over his goggles. So he puts his goggles on first, then the magnification. Um, and if I'm, if I'm correct, I think he puts a, a shield in front of that. So that's, that's a way to use loops, for instance. And the, the plastic footprint, I mean, that's a huge issue. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that needs to be dealt with. But I think at the moment, everybody's in survival mode um, just to survive COVID. So yeah. Okay, and then here's a question that I need to respond to. There's a, a, an anonymous uh, listener who's asking uh, if they need to reply for CPD certificates. Now, let me just clarify this. I thought uh, it was clear, but then let me clarify it. Those that are watching the webinar via Zoom will get the CPD points automatically. Once you register, 
the system compiles a list of all registrants, and then we will send you the CPD certificates based on how long you stayed for the session. And those who are watching us live on Facebook, you can go to our website and there's, there's a set of questions that you need to, to, ask, to answer and send back to info at SADA so that they can be marked and then we can give you a certificate. So those that are attending directly via Zoom, you do not need to respond to any questions or answer any questions. Just by being here for the session, you will receive a certificate according to the duration that you stayed for the webinar. I hope that clarifies it. And then uh, the next question, please can you explain doping again with using second gloves? So the second glove, the idea is the area needs to be cleaned. So if you have one pair of gloves on, um, the second pair you put on, so you have your one pair, you do hand hygiene, you put a second pair on. Now you can clean your whole clinical area and then you're ready to take off your booties and your gown with the dirty gloves, the outer gloves. Um, after the hand hygiene that you did prior to, to donning the second pair, the, the gloves are considered disinfected, if I'm, if I'm correct. So um, yeah, so that's the idea. So you have your one pair on, you do hand hygiene, then you put your second pair over that pair, you clean your room, you take off your booties, you take off your gown with the second pair, and then that pair that you have on is disinfected. So then, yeah, you can continue with the doffing procedure. Okay. Um, I think this one I should have screened out because this one will be answered in, in, in tomorrow's, in Thursday's webinar. So I'm going to skip that one, uh, Dr. Kingsley. This one will be covered in, in Thursday's webinar. With the limited PPE available, how practical is it to change PPE after every patient? So, so this is something that will be covered on Thursday. So Dr. Smith and Dr. Marie, this one you don't need to, to respond to. Um, if you have been infected with the virus and you have recovered as 98% of the people will, would you still go through these extreme measures? I think Dr. Swart, maybe you can come in there. Dr. Swart? Yes. Um, the uh, protocol, clinical protocol that's been written has got two main aims. The one is to stop viral spread to the community. And the second is to keep the practitioner and his staff safe. That is the only two rules uh, that was followed to write this protocol because there's no cure for the virus. So thus, if you are immune after having been uh, uh, ill, it does not mean that you must stop uh, spreading the virus because if you are irresponsible, you can spread the virus. So that is uh, to the detriment of your community. Dr. Swart, I think the next question also relates to, to you. Uh, so maybe you can stay there. It makes no sense that levels in dentistry correspond to lockdown levels of government. If rate of infection is increasing, why are we being allowed to do more treatment? Surely for our safety and that of our patients, we should still be, oh, we should still be restricted. I, uh, I, my sentiments exactly to the person that's asked that question, because uh, although we are in level three, we are seeing an increase in viral load, especially in hotspot areas, as well as incidences. The rest of the world has stopped uh, doing dentistry at this level of viral spread. In South Africa, um, people were really suffering economically. And that is why we are going back and doing work in a level three capacity. Although the viral spread is that of a level five or even higher. And the CEO of SARA has made that statement as soon as level three was announced. So it now boils down to the individual practice owner. Uh, on what their following actions are going to be. 
if you're in a hot spot and you find yourself unsafe, it is most probably better to stop your activity for a certain amount of time. But if you are in an area where it is virtually unknown to have uh, COVID positive cases, then surely you can uh, continue working. The first restrictions was set so that the healthcare workers could get their uh, uh, house in order to face the enormity of the viral um, wave that is coming our way and which we are experiencing at this stage. So yes, we are, according to government law, they sh the viral load should be moderate at this stage. And in certain hotspots, it certainly isn't. Okay. Um, doctors, I don't know which one, uh, who this question belongs to, but it says, can you help the dinosaurs and explain how one goes about getting Zappa and snap can, can, snap scans? I'll, I'll answer this one. Okay. <laughs> so that's the only easy question that, any, that they've asked tonight. <laughs> um, it's actually very easy to get this. Um, if, you, if you want to um, get a universal master pass, um, I would suggest um, speaking to Capitec. So Capitec has the option that they, they give you a little, it's um, one of the, what do you call those? QR codes. You get a QR code that um, can be used for SnapScan and Zapper. Um, so it's called a master pass basically. And it connects to either your credit card machine or your to, to your internet banking. Um, you can, if you don't want to use that, you can also just contact, um, just Google Zapper or Google um, SnapScan, and one of the salespeople will be in contact with you if you just ask them to to, to set it up for you. Um, and you, they're also quite negotiable with their fees. So if you go through the Capitec um, Master Pass. And they give it to you at the same rates as your credit card machine, which is very helpful. Um, whereas SnapScan and Zapper individually charge quite high rates. So that's a, it's a nice way of getting past the high rates. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, Dr. Marie, here's a question for you as well. Can we use the same N95 mask through the day, but change our gown, gloves, hat and boots so i i think blackie uh, has more detail on that but but what i've seen in the protocol is um there's extended use and then there is reuse i think so extended use means you put one on in the morning you keep it for the whole day um, and then reuse is you swap it for every patient and then circulate them through every seven days so the extended use, I think, is is more dangerous or is is not advised um, because you keep that one thing. You you create the incubator for the virus if you, if it got infected. So or if there was contamination, you breathe that same viral load the whole day. So you want to swap it for every patient. And yeah, I don't want to comment on the reuse. Um, I think Black needs to talk about that. But in the protocol. They spoke about reuse and extended use, and I know that reuse is more advisable than extended use. Okay. Anonymous, this question about N95 and the prices of PPE, that is something that will also be addressed on Thursday. So I'm going to skip that question. Uh, we will address it on Thursday. The next one, um, if we are in a financial position to not be at work, do you advise us to stay at home? Is that what is safest for us? Sure. I don't know who's going <laughs> to answer that question. I wish I was in that guy's shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Which practice is uh, this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, here's another one. We are two practices which occupy a joint building and share a receptionist. I am doing everything by the book but my colleague is resistant to change and complying with SADA protocols. I am finding it impossible to get across to across that teamwork is essential and protocols need to be uh, unilateral. 
any advice? Um, I also work in a practice where we have more than one practitioner. So that can be very challenging. Um, it's, it's really challenging if a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions. Um, I would suggest that you um, ask the other practitioner to help you to write a protocol. Um, and in that way, you can combine the strengths of two practices to get to a, um, a midway. Um, it's, it's of no use to butt heads with someone if, they're not, if they don't want to do it. But maybe if you can ask them to help you to do a protocol, um, you can get somewhere. But it is important to work together now. Okay. Here's another question. Why is autoclaving reusable gowns necessary if soap and water kills the virus? Um, I think that, that is the advice, right? No, I think um, you want to be as safe as possible. So, so, I mean, if soap and water kills it, then that's fine. Um, I just think if you have extra measures like an autoclave, why not use it? Okay. And then Dr. Marie, this one specifically says it's for you. Are we not meant to reuse, uh, to use reusable gowns, sorry? Are we not meant to use reusable gowns? Why can't we wash the gowns? Um, like I said, I'm just going according to the protocol that was provided by SODA. So, so the, pro the provided protocol is a disposable gown. Um, but like I said, if you have a reusable gown, it just needs to be a sterile item when you when you done it. So, yeah. Okay, uh, this is also for you. Can a reusable gown be sprayed with surface disinfectant and left to air dry before reusing? And what is the recommended time lapse between this? I don't think it is advisable to, to spread. I don't think there's any research on that. If there is, then, then I haven't seen it, but um, I think a disposable gown is, is supposed to be discarded after each patient. Okay. Um, this one says you cannot use, they say Googles, but I think they mean goggles. If you use loops, please explain. Um, so, I mean, Blackie does it. So Blackie puts his loops, over his goggles. So he has goggles that looks like swimwear. It's like the small ones. And he has his loops on there and that's how he uses it. So, so if, yeah, he, you can do that if he is doing it. Um, and then you can disinfect the goggles. So I, I'm not sure about the face shield over or disinfect the loops. I'm not sure about the face shield over the loops, um, but I know you can disinfect your loops with a surface disinfectant like you would do with your goggles. Um, so I think you just need to put your loops over the goggles or in front of it. Okay, how and where do you dispose doffed disposable PPE? So you, you have to dispose of it in the red bin um, and then your medical waste company needs to collect it. Okay. Um, I'm trying to skim through the questions. Dr. Clement seems to be coming a lot. Um, Dr. Corne Smith, you are, <laughs> you are a honey. Thank you for your talk, tips, and enthusiasm to help. To help, God bless you. Dr. Smith, that's a, a shout out to you, if I can put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Okay, these are, these are, these are certainly topics that will be discussed on, on Thursday. Okay, can all reusable gowns be autoclaved? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think you need to follow the manufacturer's instructions when it comes to gowns or different gowns, but yeah, I'm not sure of that. Okay, and they say, Dr. Marie, using a half mask respirator with a pan like with a pancake like filter, for example, two two zero three eight P three type. Do you know if one can sterilize these filters uh, by means of of UV or autoclave in order to stretch 
the longevity of the filters. I I haven't used those those respirators um, at all, so I'm not sure about that. Um, maybe Blackie can answer can answer that question. I'm I'm really not sure. I'm not going to try and answer that. Okay. I think let's. Okay. Oh, it is not uh, uh, autoclavable at all. Yeah. That answers it. And I think this one can a surgical mask be used over an N95? Um, Blackie will Blackie will do a webinar on Thursday um, where they discuss that. Um, but no, it's it's not advised. Um, the recommendations has changed, um, but Blackie will discuss all of that on Thursday. Okay, Anonymous has said that, uh, sorry, but my question was not regarding a disposable gown. It was for a reusable waterproof type material. What was the question? Uh, I think it's the one that speaks about uh, washing. Uh, Anonymous, we've really, can you retype the question then we can read it out uh, because we've lost what you had asked previously. Do uncontaminated gowns examples, those worn only for consult need to be disposed in the red bin? Dr. A, Marie? A disposable gown no. or? Uh, okay, anonymous Dr. Marie would just like to know whether the gown is reusable or, or disposable. Um, the question about uh, uncontaminated disposable. gowns. If it no, is no, disposable, no. then it needs okay. to be disposed. Okay. Uh, Dr. Smith, I think we're going to conclude the questions now. But Dr. Smith, here's a question for you. You mentioned WhatsApp business. For us oldies, how does this benefit over WhatsApp? Uh, do you still have to have every person loaded on as a contact to be able to WhatsApp? Uh, so the main difference between WhatsApp and WhatsApp for Business is that you have control over automated responses. So if you use WhatsApp for Business, the setup would include a, still a smartphone um, that's connected to a cell phone number, but then you can use that on your computer screen as well. So you have you load WhatsApp for Business or any WhatsApp actually, you can load onto your computer on your screen. And in that way, um, you can um, have easier control um, as a um, if the receptionist actually uses this as a contact tool. Um, unfortunately, you still have to um, add people's contact details. Um, there is a way that you can add all the details if you have it as a as a um, a CV, CSV file or as a uh, what do you call a business card file? It's a specific file that you need. And you can, if you have a list of your contacts, you can just load it onto WhatsApp for Business. Um, but there are several tools that WhatsApp for Business has that just makes it easy to communicate. So if someone contacts your practice and it's after hours, there's an automated response. Um, and so simple things like that, that just makes it easier. And it's still all for free. Uh, Dr. Marie, uh, Anonymous has said that, yes, it's a disposable gown. So uncontaminated disposable gowns, examples, those worn only for consult, do they need to be disposed in the red bin? So I think so, yeah. Um, I think between each patient, if it's a disposable gown, then, then it has to be discarded off. I'm just here um, for the donning and doffing procedure not for the specifications on the PPE, um, but I think according to what I know, if it's a, if it's a disposable item and you used it with a patient, um, then I think it needs to be discarded or yeah, disposed of. Um, Dr. Swart and Dr., uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Marie, I'm just skimming through the questions and I see a lot of them are on PPE that like to know about loops and how Goggles are used with loops. I think Dr. Swart and and, and will cover these in their in their webinar on 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 Thursday. So I think it's safe for us to say we can conclude the evening. Um, 
thank you very much, uh, doctors. If there's any parting shots that you'd like to, to make or any, any uh, par parting remarks or statements, please do so before we end the, the session. Um, I, I think maybe I can just um, end off with a comment. Um, I think we're all very confused. Uh, there's very little answers at the moment and we shouldn't be uh, discouraged by the fact that we don't have the answers. And we should be encouraged by the fact that we're all in this together and we're trying to figure it out. Um, and if we just do the best we can and we act responsibly, um, I think that we will get through this. But we, we can't have all the answers. It's impossible. Absolutely. There are no answers. But we, mm. we have to be responsible for ourselves and our patients. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Marie? Yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's good to have these webinars to discuss everything. And, and we have a protocol that we're following. And that's purely on, on information that we have at this current time. Um, everybody is still figuring it out. So um, it is like when I said, we should be encouraged by everyone working together um, and not discouraged by, by not uh, having all the answers. So mm. yeah, just stay as safe as you possibly can. Absolutely. Dr. Swart, is there anything that you'd like to, or any remark that you'd like to make? No, there's uh, really no other remarks, um, but uh, we'd like to conclude this webinar, I think, with a discussion on PPEs um, on Thursday night, where we have uh, Dr. Egon Huber from Italy joining us, um, and we discuss the difficulties that the practitioners have in their practices uh, concerning PPE. Um, and I think a lot is made about PPE, but the discussions here tonight on the practice management and the donning and doffing of that is most probably the most important part uh, because the virus is mostly spread by when the patient takes off his masks and uh, speaking and coughing in the practice uh, without it being covered. Mm. Mm. I think uh, that, that, that sums up everything, uh, doctors and ladies and gentlemen. And I think, Dr. Smith, you said something that is very profound. We should not be worried about the fact that we do not have all the answers. This is, this is uncharted terrain for everybody. And everybody's feeling a lot of uncertainty. And everybody is just trying to get as much information as we possibly can. And I think all these webinars that, that we are having on a weekly basis should assist in some way. So I hope to see everybody on, on, on Thursday when we unpack PPE a bit more and maybe some of the questions that were posed today will be able to, to be answered. So thank you very much to everybody for for giving us your time, for sacrificing your evening. Um, you can now go prepare supper. Uh, Dr. Swart, you can go eat your supper. So <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for joining. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.